Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsein with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're happy to have join us Jeremy Utley. Jeremy is the Director of Executive Education at Stanford's Design School and a junk professor at Stanford School of Engineering. Uh, he is the co-host of D-School's widely popular program entitled Stanford's Masters of Creativity. Uh, he has written a new book entitled Ideal Flow, the only business metric that matters. And uh, you're really going to enjoy uh, our conversation with Jeremy. Jeremy, can you give us just a little bit of your uh, background, a little bit of your story? Absolutely. Yeah. I've been for the last 13 years, I've been leading executive programs at Stanford's Design Institute, which is a cross disciplinary institute for innovation at Stanford University. I've been leading pr primarily professional development programs and then as well a couple of programs for graduate students, a premier accelerator called Launchpad and a leadership program called Leading Disruptive Innovation. And so the book is really a synthesis of a bunch of those experiences and stories from not only graduate students and entrepreneurs, but also large organizations seeking to rejuvenate their offerings through innovation. Hmm. Well, I've got a, a copy and I see there's some copies behind you, but a copy of your book. It's it's a, a great read and encourage people to pick up a, a copy and, and uh, some great, great thoughts. And I love the idea that uh, that you can solve problems. Uh, a lot of times we just throw more time and uh, effort into it. Like getting more ideas and the flow of ideas can help solve big problems. Talk a little bit about kind of how you came up with the idea. I know you've been teaching for quite a while, but how did you come up with the, the thought around the uh, the book? Well, you know, one of the things that people just categorically underappreciate is the volume of ideas you need to really break through. Mm -hmm. And we've been familiar with research for a long time, but we are always amazed at how no one else is. I mean, th there's this is a empirically established truth that the greatest variable that affects how good your ideas are is how many ideas you have. And so you kind of, and maybe people get that a little bit. They go, okay, so I need more ideas than I would think. Well, then if you ask them, how many ideas do you need? How many does it take to get to a commercial breakthrough? Most folks underestimate by an order of magnitude or two, right? The empirical evidence suggests it's two or 3,000 ideas are required to get to a commercial breakthrough. Most people think in terms of 20 or 30, right? So they're not sure. just one order of magnitude off, they're multiple. And as we travel around the world, helping entrepreneurs and innovators and corporate leaders, we find that folks routinely underestimate the volume of ideas they need to be generating. And then their innovation efforts are stalted because they aren't able to have sufficient volume in their pipeline. And even if you know we teach ideation techniques, we teach experimentation techniques and on and on, what a lot of organizations find, you know, if you ask them, do you have an, do you have a problem with the number of ideas you have or do you have a problem of knowing which of your many ideas are good and worthy of investment? Nobody ever says they don't have enough ideas. Everybody says, we have a lot of ideas. Our people are full of ideas. We just don't know which ones to resource. So we teach them tools for rapid experimentation and, and rapid learning. And to an individual, to an organization, after a cycle of experimentation, you know what everybody says? We need a lot more ideas, right? Mm. And so whether you feel like you've got a lot of ideas or not, the truth and, and the, the theory behind idea flow is actually you need to be in the routine habit of generating and testing ideas. It's not just like this moment in time where, where you say, all hands on deck, we got to innovate. That's, that's tantamount to telling a bunch of people who've been sitting on the couch eating Cheetos, let's go run a marathon. It's like, sure. that's, you know, there's got to be some training. There's got to be some stretching. There's got to be some preparation and innovation. If, as long as it's just treated like an event or a point in time, mm -hmm. will always stall out insofar as it gets nurtured as a capability, as a valuable capability in the organization, then organizations are capable of delivering the next breakthrough after the next breakthrough after the next breakthrough. Um, a lot of our listeners are first-time leaders, maybe of just 
inherited a team uh, mm. and uh, they're having to solve a lot of problems. How do you nurture that that culture of innovation and, and idea flow? Well, it, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot. How do I draw the creativity out of my team? And I would say, what do you mean by creativity? Very simply, if if by creativity you mean artistry, I would say chances are your team may not have much artistry, right? But which I don't believe that, obviously. But the point is definitions matter. So what's creativity? You want to have a creative team. Well, what's creativity? My favorite definition actually comes, and you might have seen it in the book, comes from a seventh grader in Ohio who said, creativity is doing more than the first thing you think of. And that's a phenomenal definition. One, because it doesn't have any reference to the arts, which is great. It's doing more than the first thing you think of in sales, in engineering, in compliance, in financial accounting, et cetera, et cetera. I know creativity and accounting seems anathema, right? But as a (laughs) former management consultant, as a recovering MBA, I can say for sure, lots of creativity is needed in accounting. But anyway, if you think about creativity as, as the ability to generate more ideas or more solutions than you need to a problem, then as a leader, if I say, how am I going to draw the creativity out of my team? The question is, how do I get my team to do more than the first thing they think of? Oh, wow. You mean the marketing campaign? Do more than the first thing we think of? You mean the new product launch? Do more than the first thing we think of? You mean the the you know the annual all hands meeting? Do more than the first thing we think of? And all of a sudden, that practical definition is incredibly empowering to a leader. You know, as Astro Teller, who's the head of Google X, the moonshot factory at Google, as he says, anytime he's commissioning a team to work on something, he asks them for five ideas not one. Mm. Bob McKim was a legendary progenitor of the design program. Anytime a student asked for feedback, he'd say, show me three, right? So whether it's McKim's three ideas or Astro Teller's five ideas, the point is a leader who's trying to institute creativity and innovation looks for a volume of possibilities. And Astro, what he told me is it's fascinating because now teams at Google X will try to kind of game the system. And they'll bring, you know, the idea that's their pet favorite. And then they'll bring four dummy ideas. And he said, what happens is many times one of the dummy ideas is every bit as good as their favorite idea, right? But the the practice of generating alternatives and generating options is incredibly valuable. And when you see as a leader, if if I'm trying to bring creativity out of my team, that's really what I'm doing is is helping them remember to flex the muscle of generating options. That's an incredibly practical and straightforward task. So as a leader of a team, and I've I've been a part of these where people get in a room and say, today we're going to brainstorm. And so we get you know a few ideas is thrown up on a, either a whiteboard or you get post-it notes and throw them up. What's a better way to generate more ideas as a leader and again to to kind of lead the team and to help them to to think differently well a, a couple of things come to mind one is i would say individually related the other is kind of group genius related on the individual front having people have an attitude or a routine practice around one noticing problems and two generating solutions very simply but it's something that we can do every single day you know somebody who's trying to build their athletic ability when they go to the grocery store. Like I watch my little sister, who's a fantastic volleyball player. She goes to get a jug of milk from the refrigerator. You know what she does? She does a few curls on the way back to the cart, right? Why? Because she's got that athletic mindset. And someone who's got an innovation mindset, they're generating options. It's it's just like doing dumbbell curls with a gallon of milk, right? It's, It's an opportunity to flex the muscle. So that's something that you can do on an individual basis. Then in terms of on a group basis, what's what's better than a brainstorm? Well, a brainstorm, most of the time, what that implies, it's a word that kind of transfers a lot of knowledge or, or mythology, as the case may be. A brainstorm, a lot of times, is we're going to get in a room. I'm going to say what the problem is. Everybody's going to come up with brilliant ideas, and then we're going to choose and, you know, you know, kind of dust our hands off, you know, pat ourselves on the back and high five. We did it, right? Well, that's not what we have seen and what research demonstrates is a good brainstorm. A better way to approach a brainstorm is what we call an innovation sandwich, where you kind of break the the typical brainstorm into four different phases. Phase one precedes the typical. Phase three and four follow the typical. So what's phase one? Phase one is let folks know about the challenge ahead of time. 
Don't just surprise them in the moment, right? Sure. Tell them about the challenge and ask them, come with a few ideas, right? I thought we wanted to brainstorm. I thought we wanted a free flow of ideas. I thought we didn't want to anchor people. No, bringing a few ideas is a great thing, right? Then normal meeting, don't evaluate, don't judge, and don't choose. What you do in that normal meeting is you build on everybody's ideas and you create a dynamic where instead of people think, um, instead of the default question being, what do I think of Mark's idea? I say, what does Mark's idea make me think of? Hmm. Right? It's a very different mindset, right? Yeah. So if everybody comes into the meeting, not trying to render judgment or pass judgment, but instead build on and be provoked or sparked by others' ideas, magic happens, right? But then importantly, at the end of that meeting, as a leader, you don't select, you don't choose. What you say is, you know, and you don't have to cite research if you're not a nerd like me, but what I would say is, hey, research suggests that the best ideas we're going to come up with collectively haven't occurred to us yet. And what's happening right now is we're priming ourselves for maybe subconscious breakthroughs. And what we'd like to suggest is that everybody keep this problem and this conversation on their minds over the next week and expect that better ideas are probably going to come to you, maybe unexpectedly, but keep it in mind. And when we meet next week, let's make some decisions. We can evaluate all the stuff we discussed today. And there's loads of great stuff. But the other important input to that conversation next week is all of the great ideas that will likely occur to the, us collectively between now and then. And then in the fourth phase, you get together, share new ideas and discuss what are selection criteria? Do we just going to implement what's feasible, what's doable? Or are we going to have more thoughtful selection criteria to enable us to preserve some of the innovation potential? And then lastly, if I had to give a dessert after the innovation sandwich, I'd say choose more than one. Because research suggests we actually don't do a great job of choosing our highest potential idea. So a lot of times brainstorm, um, it, it presupposes we're going to select the winner at the end. And what innovators do is they commission portfolios of experiments. They go, oh, these, these three or four ideas all seem pretty good. What are scrappy, low resolution ways that we can test which one of these four solves the problem best? Let's not arbitrarily choose our favorite one because the truth is we don't know what's going to work best. Now you mentioned uh, the leader of of Google X and leading the team there. Uh, what are some other qualities that you've seen in leaders that are really good at uh, allowing that idea flow to, to to happen? Well, one of the big things, Mark, is you've you've got to create an environment where someone can share bad ideas. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. You know, my dad was a corporate litigator, you know, very successful, worked at the world's largest law firm. He's arguing a case before the Supreme Court. He's been working there for decades. And there, it's a very, very difficult kind of legal matter, matter before the Supreme Court. And my dad told me this story. I, we actually were talking about another chapter in the book where we we're talking about the value of novices, of people who don't know too much about a subject area, really delivering breakthroughs. And there's a long history of people, the uninitiated, being particularly valuable sources of information and, uh, and insight. Okay, And I was talking to him about that idea. I said, have you ever had that experience? He said, oh, yeah, when we were arguing that case before the Supreme Court. He said, this kid, he, he's not two years out of law school. He doesn't even know where the copy machine is. He came into my office and he shut the door and he said, Mr. Utley, I'm either about to say the dumbest thing a lawyer has ever said, or I think I figured out how we could win this case. And my dad said, that bonehead who didn't even know where the copy machine was, identified the chain of logic that enabled us to win the case before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And what I said was, dad, what did you do that enabled a young lawyer to say to the practice area head of this enormous law firm, I'm about to say something that's very stupid, perhaps? Because that's actually the interesting thing. And a good question for you to ask yourself as a leader is, when's the last time someone shared a stupid idea with me? And what I have experienced is there's two answers really to this question. One is, I can't think of the last time someone shared a stupid idea with me, in which case I would respond, Thank you for your honesty and you have work to do, right? Because you do want people to share stupid ideas with you. The second answer is all the time. People are always sharing stupid ideas with me, in which case I'd say, thank you for your honesty. You're a jerk and you have work to do, right? <laughs> because the question isn't what ideas do you as the leader think are stupid? The question is what ideas do the person who is uh, free enough to share it thinks might be stupid? And that's really the thing is, can I create an environment where someone is willing to share something? You know, Steve Jobs, whenever he met with uh, Sir Johnny Ive for lunch, 
what Johnny Ive tells at his memorial is many days, Steve would say, hey, Johnny, you want to hear a dopey idea? And there's something to that, 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 that trust, that safety, that relationship that I just love. You want to hear a dopey idea? If your team isn't free to share, you know what? This is kind of ridiculous, but what if we did this? And they, without fear of retribution or getting immediately shot down, but at least being entertained, I think that's a really good litmus test for, as a leader, am I creating the kind of psychological safety that's required to do breakthrough thinking? I normally ask this question earlier in the conversation, but I wanted to jump in the book, make sure we didn't miss it. But if you were able to spin back time, knowing what you know now, um, what do you wish you would have known at 22? And it might be an idea that that's in your book, but uh, what do you wish you would have known earlier? You know, for me, Mark, the, the big thing is there are so there's such a narrow definition of success and productivity. And I'm not even talking about monetarily. I mean, that's kind of a, you know, a, uh, that gets harped on a lot that you don't just measure success in terms of money. I don't mean that. I mean, when you think about what does good work look like, you know, we most, most of us, you know, type a straight a students, we want to be studious. We want to be productive. We want to be focused, all this stuff. Well, as you, I I've studied the history of innovation in the last dozen years. And what I find is a lot of times breakthroughs come when you're not expecting them. When you aren't focused on the problem, you know, the, the, someone said the history of innovation is the bed, the bus and the bathtub. Right. And it's these moments where you're you're kind of you're you're almost flanking the problem, as it were. And it's not to say that you don't have to prepare and that you don't have to there's a, a critical kind of psychological stage, like a, a typical framework for innovation is or uh, illumination, the, the light bulb moment is preparation, incubation, illumination, validation. So you gotta prepare. But then this incubation time is this weird time. You know, whenever Einstein was stuck on a math problem or on a physics problem, you know what he would do? He'd play his violin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that most students, you know, most 22 year olds think if I'm stuck on a problem, what does a responsible person do? Works harder. Mm -hmm. I sit and I just stare at it. You know, you know, Joyce Carol Oates, when she's stuck on a plot line in one of her novels, she says poetically, as only Joyce Carol Oates can say, there's always an idea waiting on top of the hill behind my house. I've just got to go get it which is a poetic way of saying I take a walk, right? Mm -hmm. But I think for a lot of us, if we're stuck on a plot line, we go, well, the last thing I could do is take a break right now. The last thing I could do is play my violin. And so to me, all that to say, I had an exceptionally narrow definition of what good looked like. And I felt guilty a lot. I think in in my body and in my mind, I knew I needed a break, but I I took breaks, quote unquote, feeling deeply guilty and ashamed and looking over my shoulder, you know, mm -hmm. and I wish that I had more permission to deviate from the standard ways of being productive when I was younger. I wish that I felt that permission and that I felt actually I can wield these moments as ways of solving problems rather than retreat to them as ways of getting away from the problem. What are some great questions that people forget to ask uh, as they're leading a, a, a team? Is anything that you would put on the top of the list to be to be asking continually as far as of, of teams? Anything else that you mentioned a few, but yeah, you know, yeah, I have mentioned a few, you know, when's the last time somebody asked me something, said something stupid, you know, um, show me three, what, you know, uh, one way to say that is what else are we trying? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great question. What else are we trying? And that's a great permissive question to give because it implies two things. Trying implies that we don't have to get it right. And we're probably not going to get everything that we do right. But what else implies the solution lies in volume, right? And a lot of times a leader will come and people will think they've got to be the answer guy. They got to be the answer gal. And what I like to say is, no, you need to be the approach gal. You don't, and increasingly there's the world's too complex. There's, there's no way for you to have all the answers, but do you have an approach that works? So that's kind of, you know, what else are we trying is a great thing. The other question is what's the problem we're trying to solve? And a lot of times the problem gets taken for granted or as given. And, you know, so we, we, we get really focused on problem solving mode. And a lot of times problem finding or problem framing is actually where the innovation lies. You know, John Dewey once said, a problem well put is half solved. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the key insight moment is actually going, you know what the real problem is? It's this other thing, right? I love the story of, I can't remember, um, 
oh, what's his name? It's escaping me. 1920s employee of uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Dick Drew, I think is his name. He's sitting, um, he's selling, they make um, abrasives and he's selling um, sandpaper to a auto body shop. And he said he's sitting eating his lunch, eating his sandwich, and he's watching. And he realizes as he's watching that in order to they they sand down the bodies of these cars. It's in the 1920s. But then whenever they go to paint them, anytime they they they're trying to block certain areas of the car, but the tape is tearing off the paint. Hmm. And he said, you know, it would be interesting is if you could make a tape that didn't tear off the paint. It wasn't so sticky. And Dick Drew in that moment invented masking tape. And by the way, it was a side project, but he realized the problem that needed to be solved wasn't sanding or, or a different problem. Maybe sanding was a valuable problem, but the other problem was they can't get through a paint job because they keep ripping off the paint. And his company, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, became 3M. And they actually realized they in the first five years, they sold more masking tape than they, they'd ever sold a sandpaper. And they realized we're actually not an abrasives company. We're an adhesives company, right? <laughs> we're in the business of sticking stuff to paper. And we actually thought it was the abrasives, but it's not, right? But the point is having a, having a willingness to kind of entertain new problems is a really, really valuable thing. And as a leader, just getting clarity for the team, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? And then furthermore, can we interrogate the problem from a bunch of different angles? You know, what are 10 ways of stating the problem? That's actually, you know, Einstein said, someone asked him, how do you have so many breakthroughs when you, when there are scientists with a higher IQ than you have? And he said, well, it takes me longer to solve problems. And they said, why is that? And he said, because I never solve a problem before looking at it from seven to nine different angles. Hmm. And there's something about whenever you start looking at a problem from different angles, new opportunities present themselves in a way that they don't whenever you're thinking about problem solving. So. Are there any practical things that you do uh, personally, as far as to kind of help with that idea flow? Uh, you know, you mentioned doing something else sometimes is the best way to get that flowing. Anything else that's been helpful that uh, that you think would would help those that are trying to figure out a problem? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the tips that we advocate in the book is what we call a daily idea quota where every day you find a problem that you're trying to look for the right answer to, which is basically all that's every problem we're trying to solve. We're looking for quote unquote, the right answer. What we don't realize though, is we, we aren't mathematicians. Very few of the problems we're trying to solve have one right answer, right? What should the subject line of this email be is not a math problem. There's a thousand possible right answers. How should I deliver this feedback? How should I open this presentation? How, you know, for me, practical example, my kids the other day broke a 115 year old window in my home. My home's built in 1908. Okay. So it's irreplaceable. Well, the problem I'm trying to solve is what should the consequence be? How do I respond as a father? Right. I did an idea quota. Seems kind of nerdy, but I sat down and said, okay, I know that my instinct, like I've got the usual suspects of consequences. We can ground them. We can take away their devices. Have we thought about grounding them? You know, really quickly, you kind of, <laughs> the usual suspects for all you got. Well, an idea quota says, instead of looking for the right answer, generate 10 possible answers. And your goal is actually quantity rather than quality. And I did an idea quota. I, I've actually written up a little chat bot. I can share with you if folks want to try it, but a little chat bot to kind of just walk me through going through the idea quota. And you know, it's amazing. The 10th idea was actually awesome. I was shocked, right? And I do the idea quota just to stay flexible and to, to build the instinct towards volume, because I know that the tendency to fixate on one idea is deeply rooted. It's a deeply rooted cognitive bias. But, but sometimes when I'm engaging that practice, I get a way better idea. And I was delighted. I mean, just the other day at the kind of parenting breakthrough I had, right? So this isn't just about business, or new products, new services. It can be about internal stuff. It can be about household stuff, life stuff. Generating volume is a really important behavior and it's something that we need to engage regularly. Yeah. Great, great thoughts. Um, so what uh, what books have been impactful and that you would recommend to other leaders? We definitely want to put this one on the list, The Idea Flow. Uh, yeah, Idea Flow. Anything else that you think would would be helpful as, as people are? You know, if, if folks are interested in this area of innovation, I find biographies are really rich. I'm just looking at my bookshelf here. Um, one I love is Mark Randolph's book called That Will Never Work about the founding of Netflix. That's really cool. Hmm. 
Um, another exceptional book is John Gertner's The Idea Factory, which is a history of AT&T's Bell Labs. I love that book. Phil Knight's Shoe Dog is, of course, spectacular. Ed Catmull's Creativity Inc. is another uh, just exceptional book. Um, but I, I really, I really like these biographies because I feel they, um, I can pull practical examples from people's lives. Yeah. So outside of work, what do you, what do you do to recharge? You know, for me, I've got, as I mentioned, I've got four daughters. And so Mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time in the woods. We love playing in the woods and in the creeks, you know, the mountains here between basically the, the Bay area and the ocean are just, you know, a paradise, you know, it's like a natural playground, right? So we spend a lot of time in the, in the redwoods. We spend a lot of time, you know, tromping around the creeks. We've got a Malamute uh, puppy who we take everywhere with us. And he's sitting here outside my door right now, looking at me. Um, I'm also, (laughs) I'm also actively involved in my church community. I'm a Christian and I'm deeply involved in my church community here, which is a very important part of my life. And then of course, I'm a Golden State Warriors fan and, uh, (laughs) And a Dallas Cowboys fan, interestingly enough. So between uh, the Warriors and the Cowboys, n- now's a good time of year. <laughs> yeah, we we don't like the the Cowboys as as Viking fans. So you uh, know, right, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, there's they're doing okay this year. So yeah, well, this has been Jeremy a lot of fun, and and definitely encourage everybody to pick up your book. And yeah, please uh, do. Would uh, would love to uh, hear. I asked you if you were. If you were writing another book or had one in that, and it's like, that's a terrible question to ask somebody who's just uh, spent a lot of time, but you've got some other projects going on. How would they learn more about you and your work? Uh, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Thanks for asking. If, if um, I, you know, I keep a regular blog at my website, jeremyutley.design. Um, and, you know, with the book, uh, season. It's been less, I used to write every single day. Now I'm kind of lucky if I can get in a post per week, but I try to share insights and tips and tricks and stories and things like that there. And then uh, our our book website's great, ideaflow.design. It's a great spot to go. We've actually got a free bonus chapter there. Folks can go pull down called How to Think Like Bezos and Jobs, which is a cool kind of summary of seven ways that Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs have approach problem solving in their businesses. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, I'm, I'm easy to find online. Twitter is Jeremy Utley. LinkedIn is Jeremy Utley. So super easy to find. I love hearing from people, love connecting with people. I'd be glad to um, to hear from your listeners. Well, thanks so much for taking time out of your, your schedule to talk. And this has been a lot of fun and I wish you continued success in all you're doing. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mark. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.